author Sidney Kirkpatrick. Hollywood's funniest was literally in tears. And what they were crying about was the tragedy that was Mabel Norman, a brilliant, a wonderful um, you know, pioneer film actress, a, a woman who literally lit up the screen, was torn up uh, you know, by a, a series of tragedies, one after the other, and it literally destroyed her. Mabel's story begins on November 9, 1892, not 1895, as her gravestone suggested. Mabel Ethel Reed Norman was born on Staten Island in New York, the youngest of Claude and Mary Norman's kids. Mabel was a wild child with an adventurous spirit. William Sherman is the author of Mabel Norman, a source book to her life in film. She was independent-minded and courageous and a bit reckless and fun and easygoing and big-hearted. Uh, she had no time for phoniness and, and timidity. She was also a genuine natural-born athlete. So in, when she was in Staten Island, she was a champion swimmer. Her parents said that she swam to Bayonne and back daily. So wait, Mabel was offered a whopping 50 cents an hour to model dress patterns for a delineator magazine. It's not so surprising that she went into modeling. She posed for like Charles Dana Gibson, who's well known for his Gibson girl. She did advertisement for hats, combs, shoes, and all kinds of things. Her so Mabel, who was not considered a bathing beauty, was doing these kinds of uh, risque, as they say in those days, kind of uh, comedies showing her sexuality in some way. She was known to have done a lot of stuff, like riding horses and, and going up in hot air balloons, being tied to the railroad track, and swimming across lakes, and, and being dragged through the mud on a rope, all kinds of things. In the spring of 1913, Mabel met fellow comedian Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. Over the next three years, the duo starred in 26 films together. For example, in Mabel's Simple Life, they had this natural sort of comedic sense. So the, these different elements combined uh, give those films this certain like, special charm and, and, and fun, which is quite unique. Mabel also had fun behind the camera at Max Sennett's Keystone Studios. During the time that when Mabel said, you know, you're going to let me direct, Mac gave her a little. And particularly with this newcomer, this little creepy guy off the stage who came to be known as Charlie Chaplin. And according to Chaplin himself in his autobiography, there was a point where he as, as much fell in love with, with Mabel, but she did not return his affection in that way. And while Chaplin was lusting for Mabel, Mabel's heart still belonged to Senate. Composer and lyricist Jerry Herman wrote the 1974 Broadway musical, Mac and Mabel. I wrote a song called, I Won't Send Roses, which is my favorite song from Mac and Mabel. And the last line of the song is, I won't send roses, and roses suit you so. That here's a man who doesn't know how to say what he would like to say to her. And uh, therefore, she remains a frustrated lover all their lives together. She had the affection from thousands of fans, but never from the one man that she, that she truly loved. Norman did have a severe drug problem. She's hollow, thin, sallow. Her eyes look drugged. A gold one wanted to get rid of her, in effect. Mac wanted her back. But at this point, she was being rescued by a third man, William Desmond Taylor, who got her into a drug clinic in the East and saved her life that way. Although he would help ruin it later, inadvertently, at that moment, he saved her from the drug. In February 1922, one evening, Mabel was visiting Taylor after being there for about an hour. Taylor escorted Mabel out to her car, and that was the last she saw of Taylor, because the next morning he was found shot, lying in a pool of blood at his bungalow. And the sad irony, the, the sad truth of the matter was, you know, Mabel Norman was being helped by William Desmond Taylor. William Desmond Taylor was helping Mabel Norman learn to read. He was a mentor. He, he was her guide. He was uh, a, a, an anchor in her life. After being thoroughly interrogated by police, Mabel Norman was not charged with Taylor's murder. The crime was never solved. But just the mystery behind it and the scandal behind it, you know, it, it caught a lot of undesirable publicity and a lot of people prying and, and questions about her character. She lost her audiences very quickly. She lost some of that magic that she had, you know, and very soon she became involved in a second scandal and another shooting. And that was, the, you know, that was the death knell. 
On New Year's Day, 1924, Mabel, along with actress Edna Proviance and millionaire playboy Cortland Dines, spent the afternoon getting drunk. Mabel's chauffeur had been instructed by Mabel to take her home if she got too tipsy. The chauffeur uh, was trying to protect Mabel, and Mabel didn't want to go home, which you can see Mabel saying, oh, no, I'm not going home. The party has just begun. There was, at a certain point, this altercation between Dines and the chauffeur. Dines perhaps said some, uh, something insulting about Mabel. Uh, the chauffeur, very defensive and protective of her, um, took offense at this, and he, had, he was carrying with him a pistol, and he shot Dines. The chauffeur claimed he fired the gun at Cortland Dines in self-defense. He wasn't killed, but again, this certainly hit the headlines, and Mabel was there. They were all hauled down to the police station. And then it turns out that the chauffeur was an ex-convict who had changed his name. Mabel's ex-con chauffeur, Horace Greer, was acquitted of all charges, but the gun used in the shooting belonged to, guess who? Mabel Norman. Talk about starting the new year off with a bang. Once again, Mabel made the front page. It wasn't pretty. In 1925, 32-year-old Mabel took off for New York to star in a Broadway musical called The Little Mouse. It did not go over very well, essentially, because it was not a very good play. Uh, Mabel's voice didn't carry. It was simply was just not a good time for this kind of career change. I mean, she had saddled with so much else. So it was really not that surprising that it, it didn't work out. In the spring of 1926, 33-year-old Mabel returned to Hollywood. Movie producer and Our Gang creator Hal Roach reluctantly offered the out-of-work comedian a three-year film contract. But it was too little, too late. The damage had been done. Part of it was her own character, her being so independent, mind, flamboyant, reckless in a way. But there was, you know, people were jealous. She was powerful. And these ingredients together uh, you know, just made her life and career impossible, ultimately. Mabel drew her last breath on February 23rd, 1930. At the age of 38, the gifted comedian was finally able to rest in peace. It was like that candle in the wind, and it got blown out. You go back and you look at Mabel's films, and, you know, there, there was a, a classic talent. I mean, a, a real, genuine brilliance uh, you know to her work and it, it stands up over time it's as fresh and interesting and lively today you know as as it was back in the 20s mabel was quite different in that she was this this comical person but she was quite the adorable uh, cute gal but with this sort of sprite like mischief about her mabel was really one of the first comedic actresses to explore uh, the playfulness of women. In other words, women not being shut away, but more women being more aggressive, outgoing, you know, uh, on their own. This is, was her thing. And, and again, she was playing herself. She was a playful, warm person, but she was reckless in some ways and took chances in a way you couldn't really separate the two. 